Good morning, everyone. So, so glad that you are joining us today for Grow Zone Large Group. We are so excited that you are here because we have a great, great day in store for you. As we get started today, we want to start with our memory verse. And uh, this, is, this is a way for us to kind of hold God's Word in our heart and to, to know His Word so that we can share it with other people maybe. So today, our verse comes from Psalm chapter 95, verse 1. And this is what it says. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. And again, that's Psalm 95, 1. I want you to practice that, that this week. I want you to maybe write it down somewhere on a sticky note or something and put it on your mirror or next to your bed or something so you can read it every single day. And hopefully by next week, you will, you'll know it. You'll have it in your heart and you'll be able to say it uh, without even looking at it. Uh, as we continue, we want to get ready to sing some songs this morning. We want to worship together. Uh, so in just a moment, our worship team will, will join us and we will sing. But before we get to that, we like to do our call to worship. And this is just a reminder of how much God loves us and why we sing songs and why we get to do what we get to do to worship Him. Uh, so I'll, how it goes is I'll say a part and you'll respond and I'll say a part and you'll respond. And then at the end we'll say something together. It goes like this and the words will be on the screen for you. Just one thing. Live worthy. The gospel and everyone together, Jesus came, died, and rose again, making a way to God. So good, so excited. So wherever you are, join us in singing this morning. Maybe stand up where you're at and just join us and sing with us this morning.
You scatter darkness, light arrives in heaven, opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. When you speak, you scatter darkness, light arrives in heaven, opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it.
I'm sure you sounded so good this morning singing songs. I wish I could have heard you. Maybe I did hear you uh, because you're, you might be in the building with us today. But if I didn't hear you, I'm sure you sang as loud as you could. Uh, we love to get to sing songs to God, and we celebrate that that's something that we get to do. Uh, we are so excited today to have Camille Delaney with us to share a, an exciting story from the Bible. And today she is going to tell us a little bit about one of Jesus' disciples, Peter. Now, there is so much that we can learn from Peter. Peter was bold, and Peter was outspoken, and sometimes Peter was too bold and too outspoken, and it kind of got him into some, some trouble. And, sometime, and, and a couple of times, Peter made a big mistake, and he wasn't left in that mistake. God forgave him. Or Jesus forgave him, and he came back to him, and he gave him this huge responsibility when Jesus was going back into heaven for Peter to, to do. But I don't want to give away too much. I don't want to take away from Camille's teaching this morning, so I'm going to stop there. But before we get to her teaching, we'd love to do our Grows on Truths. And these are statements directly from the Bible about God's love for us and how much He wants us to love Him and share His love with other people. And it's kind of like our call to worship. Uh, I'll say a part and you'll respond, and I'll say a part and you'll respond. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll settle in and we'll get to our teaching. So uh, here's how Grows on Truths go. So they'll be on the screen for you. So God loves me and made me. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus is always with me. I am called by Jesus. And the last one, and always my favorite one, because I love for you guys to get really, really loud with this one. God gives us joy. Yes, God does give us joy, and He does want us to have fun, but He loves for us to learn more about Him. So I'm going to pray for us and Camille and our teaching, and and, and as we get ready to hear our teaching this morning, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for a chance for us to be together, even though sometimes we don't get to be together. We thank you for being wherever we are with us. God, we ask you now to be with Camille as she teaches and be with us as we listen, to hear something new, to learn something new, uh, so that when we, when we go out and place our sports, or go to school, or do our activities, whatever they may be, we would share what we learn about you with others. God, we love you so much, and thank you for loving us. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Now, wherever you are, settle in for teaching, and I'll see you afterwards for a challenge and our verse again before we go. Hey guys, how are y'all? Everybody still enjoying being at home? Not here with us. We're just almost coming back. Just a few more weeks and we'll be back in classroom. So it's good to see y'all and I hope y'all get a little bit out of this lesson. Um, so we'll get started. All right, so there's going to be a graphic on the screen and I bet everybody can tell me what that is. I'm sure everybody has some in their yard or in their driveway maybe or has thrown one or two. Yeah, it's a rock. So a rock is solid and strong. You can build things with rocks. Rocks can even be used to defeat the enemies. Who can think of a place in the Bible that rocks were mentioned? And I bet most of y'all remember where David and Goliath fought, and David used a rock, a rock to defeat Goliath. And Jesus said that if people don't praise God, the rocks will, cut, will cry out. The most important rock was the one that was rolled away from the tomb <coughs> when Jesus was in there. But this rock reminds me of Peter. So who is Peter? And I think my last lesson was a little bit on Peter. He was a disciple. His original name was Simon, but Jesus changed his name to Peter. So listen to what Jesus said about Peter. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied. They were like, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. And one of the other prophets, and he, he said, well, but what about you? He asked, what do you say I, who, who you say I, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus said that, the, the, said that Peter was a rock. Upon that rock, he would build his church. Some of y'all may have heard a song about that before. 
So let's take a few more minutes from our <coughs> to check in with our barn friends before we go any further. Trackers of Faith, featuring Duke and Luke, the Barn Brothers, Penny, the cold cracking tech savvy gal who is quick on her feet, Walker, the big hearted handyman who uses his mechanical know how to lend a helping hand, Jenny, the fun loving biblical brains of the operation, and Milton. This super sassy swine has been fitted with the latest in animal communication technology. Join this crew of high-tech heroes as they sow truth, know truth, and grow truth. Tractors of Faith! Okay, guys. Frank and I never made it to the letters that Peter wrote. Even after we put away the flashlight, we were tempted to go back. But wait, wasn't Peter kind of in hot water when Jesus was crucified? He denied Jesus three times. You're telling me his letters made it into the Bible even after that? Well, that's right. When Jesus invited Peter to be a disciple, Jesus said, And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And when Jesus said something, <laughs> let me tell you, it's true. Yeah. After the resurrection, Peter was solid in his faith. He was brave and bold and true to Jesus. He spoke up when it was hard to do so. He led many to believe the good news of Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he performed many miracles in the name of Jesus. And he never denied him again. Let me pull up 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, the start of his first letter. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Galatia, I remember that place. Jay, Duffy, Jenny, and I went back there when we were exploring Paul's letters. So did we. It looks like all these areas are close to one another, in Asia Minor, where present-day Turkey is. You guys think we could check it out? I actually think we should check out Rome. Rome? Why? Well, in verse 513, Peter says that he's writing from Babylon, which is kind of New Testament code for Rome. And since we never actually got to go to Rome... I'm following you. Maybe we could go back and see Peter writing this letter firsthand. I'm up for it. Me too. All right, then. Let's go. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed but praise God that you bear that name. Whoa, that's kind of heavy. Let's head back and talk about it. So what's the deal? Peter was really talking a lot about suffering there. Sometimes as Christians, we might encounter challenges and people might want to cause harm to us simply because of what we believe. That's what was happening to the people who received this letter. Peter was writing to encourage the church as they experienced those undeserved trials and suffering. It sounds like he was a real encouragement to them in the hard time. I can only imagine what his words meant. A little later he said, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, and that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amazing, what a great word. It is, you're absolutely right. Grandpa Woodrow, thanks for pointing us towards Peter. We'll mark Rome and these other areas on the map. Where else didn't you make it? Well, I know this is gonna be surprising, but Frank and I never made it to Ephesus. Wait, seriously? That seems like such an easy one. It was. But the day we planned to go was the day Luke was born, so I had to bail. Sounds like Ephesus is the next stop. Again? I'm sure a lot of y'all could tell me what y'all saw and learn something from the video. So Peter's personality was very strong. He was brave, but he was definitely had a weak moment. Some of us all do, right? He thought he was strong enough never to fail Jesus. But he did fail Jesus. And he had to learn that his strength was from God, not from himself. Who remembers what Jesus told Peter just before he was arrested? 
That's right. Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times. And Peter was like, there's no way that I'm going to deny you three times. Jesus said, yes, before the, the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he didn't believe it, but it happened just like Jesus said it would. Peter denied him not once, not twice, but three times. So Peter must have felt so terrible. He probably had not done the worst thing in the world. I mean, he just, can you imagine failing the Lord, the person that you knew was the son of the Messiah, and you thought that you had all this might in you not to, not to deny him, but you did anyway? He must have felt so bad. I'm sure he thought Jesus would never forgive him. And on top of all that, he was dealing with the fact that Jesus had died a terrible death. And he must have been very sad. But can anybody think of one person that forgives you for everything? And that's Jesus. So, of course, he was going to forgive Peter. So, three days later, Peter was probably worse off than he probably has ever been in his entire life. So miserable. But something amazing happened on that third day. And most of y'all know that what's coming with that rock. So three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, which was the mother of Jesus, and Salome rose early and went to the tomb where Jesus' body had been placed. They had a mission to do. The law would not let them fulfill their mission until dawn. They set out as the sun began to rise in the east and took spices to anoint the body of Jesus. So we find out in John 19.39 that Nicodemus supplied some of the spices to anoint the body of Jesus, specifically myrrh and aloe. These were often used to prepare for a body for burial. We don't know much about those spices and those kind of things nowadays. We know about myrrh, aloe, cinnamon. And where else have we heard of myrrh? Right, it was one of the th gifts that baby Jesus got from the three wise men. And it's not something we talk about today when we bury folks, but that's what they used back then for burial. They anointed their bodies with these certain uh, myrrh and aloe. And it was very um, valuable. It was kind of expensive kind of pricey for what back then what they had to pay for it so it was it was a very a great gift so you see from the very beginning Jesus was meant to die for us and we all should be grateful for what he did what came the next morning the stone had been rolled away when they got there Jesus was no longer in, no longer there instead they saw an angel in a white robe and he said three th three things to them can you be I would be scared so let's see he said, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, the one that nailed to the cross. He's been raised up, and he is no longer here. You can see for yourself that, <coughs> that the place is empty. Now, on your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there exactly as you said. Then the angel said, don't be afraid. I told, the angel told the women not to be afraid. But I would still be afraid. Can you imagine going in somewhere where somebody had passed away? This had never been heard of. He was raised from the dead. He was no longer there. He hadn't been moved. He was alive. <coughs> he was gone from the tomb. So the angel told them, look, look at the evidence. Then the angel said, go and tell. Where were they supposed to go? They were supposed to go find the disciples who were hiding in, in the home in Jerusalem. Who were these women supposed to tell? They were supposed to tell the disciples and Peter. And Peter, poor, poor, pitiful Peter, was still deeply wounded from his greatest failure of all of his life. And I'm sure, you know, the memory of that crow going off and he had denied him and it, just like Jesus said three times, he had probably had, he probably hasn't slept in three days if I was thinking, you know, he was so worried and so let down that he had let Jesus down. So, I can imagine a scene where, especially if it was three women, it would probably be kind of crazy if walked into a room, like myself and two, two of my friends, it would be a lot of screaming and a lot of carrying on and a lot of crying and then rejoicing, trying to figure out what's going on. So when the ladies go and they find the disciples in the house, Peter is still filled with grief. Then these ladies come in shouting and screaming and some are happy and some are confused and some, you know, a little bit of all of it, kind of like maybe when you go to recess and everybody's crazy, everything's going on and everything's kind of loud and people are talking and some are, car some are carrying a conversation on, some are just talking to themselves. <coughs> and so the ladies go in and when Peter hears that he isn't there, he is risen, he rushes toward, Peter goes back to the fr front of the room so he could hear more clearly to make sure he wouldn't, to make sure he was hearing them just right. 
But then he hears something else. That same rooster's crow haunting his mind and spirit once again. He turns his head back down to the corner thinking to himself, even if it was true, he wouldn't want to see me. Shame and guilt and regret threaten to break his heart once again. One of the other disciples finally halted the commotion of the women laughing and crying and the men shouting all at once with all the questions they had. And when at last there was a pause, he said, slow down. Tell us slowly. Tell us what exactly he said. One of the women rose and positioned the spokes, spokesperson and said, Jesus wasn't there and said there was a man in a white robe and he said to tell the disciples, including Peter. At the sound of his name, the rooster's crow began to become silent. And Peter thought, he called me by name. He wants to make sure that he know, that I know he was risen. He must care about me. And with that, we first see the recording occurrence of the power of resurrection. And he lives and he forgives. Because he forgave Peter immediately. And he wanted Peter to know, along with the disciples, that he had been risen. Peter's reaction. He took off running toward the Savior. He ran into the empty tomb to see for himself as he searched for Jesus with all of his heart. And it was upon a hit, this forgiven rock that Jesus built his church. The revival in Peter's heart had begun and it had, would, would ignite revival throughout the world. After the resurrection, Peter was solid in his faith. He was becoming or was that rock. So he was brave and he was bold and true to Jesus. But that meant it took Jesus being in him to be that person. He could not do it alone like he thought he could. He led many to believe the good news of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, he performed many miracles in the name of Jesus. He never denied Jesus again. And just as Paul wrote encouraging letters to other believers, do so as Peter did. The letters became two books of the Bible, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. In these books, there are many lessons that are important for us to learn. And they can be summed up into all of these three words. Glance back and look forward. In the letters that we have glances back to the Old Testament to show readers how it was fulfilled in the New Testament. He also glanced back at his failures, but he always looked back for the future, for the redemption that Jesus brings us. We can't focus on our mistakes, but we can learn from our past and what we did wrong. He described having a new birth in Jesus. He was not the same Peter as he was before. We too can experience that. And we still, make, we still may not be a Peter. We may make mistakes along the way eventually ahead we may not be as great as Peter was but you can strive to be Peter and always look forward and not backwards learn from your mistakes so it says be humble and be holy so what does it mean to be humble we don't hear a lot about being humble these days so to be humble it means to think about others before you think about yourself God as the highest of all of those people Peter was made humble when he didn't follow God as he thought he would. What does it mean to be holy? We hear holy more than we hear humble, I guess. But to be holy means to be a, to be a set part of God for a special purpose. Listen to what 1 Peter 5 through 5 through 11 <coughs> says about being humble and holy. All of you clothe yourselves in humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So God shows favor to those that take people ahead of them. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's almighty hand that he may lift up you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So you can, act, you can cast all, when you are worried about something, whether it's a test or whatever it may be, you just turn it over to the Lord and he will take care of that for you. And sometimes that's hard for me. I lay it down at Jesus' feet and I pick it back up. But God tells us to be more like Peter and lay everything down and he will take, be humble towards him and he will take care of it. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil's prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So stay true to that rock. Suffer for Jesus and surrender to Jesus. Peter was bold for Jesus, and not everyone is like that. He was put in prison for his life and often beaten and ridiculed, because, but he had learned a good lesson from the Holy Spirit. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16. 
And it says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery, fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you. And though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate into the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit and the glory of God rest on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So he's saying sometimes it's not easy to be a Christian. People may, ridic may ridic ridicule you. That's a hard word. They may make fun of you for being a Christian, but God is saying that if you are that Christian, that is actually, when God sees that, he thinks that is a, a blessing that you're getting that ridicule because you are his Christian. You are his child. Peter had learned to surrender his whole life to God. He realized that Jesus had given his life for us, so we must surrender our life to him. When we surrender our life to Jesus, we become royalty, children, the king of kings. That does not always mean an easy life, just like Peter's. It's not always easy, but it's an abund abundant and joyful life. So listen to what Peter says. 1 Peter uh, 2, 9 through 10 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, when you declare the praises of him who called you out in the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So you're a part of a kingdom. Isn't that amazing? His divine power has given all of us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him and called by his own glory and goodness, Though these issues have been given very great and very precious promises to us. So if we live through them and you participate in them, the divine nature having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. So I know that those desires are out there, but God is there for you to turn to him, to turn toward that rock, turn, to turn towards his salvation, and all of that other, you will have an abundant life. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith and goodness. Just like you're doing right now. You're adding to your faith. That's, what, that's all you have to do in life. God is there for you if you just reach out for him, look towards him. Knowledge and self-control. And to self-control, perseverance, and perseverance to godliness, and godliness to mutual affection, and mutual affection for love. For if you possess three, these three qualities, increasing in measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Not really that they're blind, but they're not looking towards the future. They're looking back too much. You just learn from those mistakes and keep looking forward. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So you see, if Peter was changed and no longer acted like the man who denied Jesus, he experimented a new birth. He became a new man. Jesus saw that Peter, even before Peter started acting like a new person, Jesus knew that he would do great things for him. That is why Jesus prayed for Peter and the rock, and on that rock he would build that church. But Peter knew that he could only be that rock because the life was built on that rock of, rock of Christ. So, listen to what 1 Peter 2, 4-7 through 7 says. And it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices of acceptance to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. So, just a small rock. I know this is something that you can hold and pick in your hand. But just think how big that one was rolled away from that tomb. You can, you can be like Peter. He was, not, he was not proud of himself. He did deny Jesus. 
But when that rock was rolled away, the first person he wanted to know, wanted to know, Jesus said, I want my disciples and Peter to know. And to me, that says the greatest thing ever. He had just denied him, and the Lord the very next morning when he was risen said, please go tell him I am risen. So always look for the future. Learn from your mistakes and don't look back, okay? Let's say a little prayer, and I'm going to let y'all go for the week. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these precious children. And Jesus, you are the living stone and the rock of our salvation. You are precious to us, <coughs> and we love you. And just lead God and protect us through the rest of the week. Amen. What a great lesson. So exciting. So much adventure. And it's all true. That's the coolest part about our stories from the Bible is everything in the Bible is true. And everything in the Bible is useful. Even today, even though it was written so many years ago, it is still useful for us today. Uh, maybe wherever you're at, say something to somebody. What is something that maybe you heard or learned from the lesson? Real quick. For me, I think, I think I needed reminded that, that God can use me even though I make mistakes. Just like Peter made mistakes, I make mistakes. But God still finds ways to use me uh, to share his message, to share his love with other people. We are so thankful that we get to do that because of God's love for us. Maybe, maybe that can be our challenge for the week. Maybe first we remember that God will forgive us. And, and maybe we think about some things that maybe we're not proud of um, that we shouldn't have done or shouldn't have said, and we ask for forgiveness for those. And the second thing is maybe we forget them because God forgets them when we ask for forgiveness. And then look for ways for God to use us to share his love and to share his message with other people. Maybe that can be our challenge for this week. But before you go, we want to do our memory verse one more time. And maybe this time you say it along with me because it will be on the screen for you. And again, it comes from Mark chapter, I'm sorry, it comes from Psalm chapter 95, verse 1. Psalm 95, verse 1. And it says this, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Again, Psalm 95, 1. Now, I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.